So I kindly welcome you to the second round of the 2024 platform. My name is Karen Donaway and I belong to the communications and technical team from the LAC platform. So from the very first session of this year of the webinars that the platform is been organized, organizing, we have given you an update on the new format that we will follow of these webinars. The approach now is not only to be an informative platform, but also we have a different, a more learning approach and a more technical approach. So we thought that this was a great opportunity to highlight these democratic elections within the CCMs and also give the, give the floor for the experience that it has been applied in the process, such as in Jamaica and, and Colombia. Let me tell you in advance that last year we, we launched the toolbox on the recommendations on these uh, democratic elections from the CCMs, from civil society and key populations in the within the CCMs. So at a, at a certain point, I will include the link of these toolbox in the chat box for you to have access in English and in Spanish. And we use these toolbox as well as the experiences that they have just lived in these countries because we want to share the best practices as well as the lessons learned of all the participants from the community and civil society within this election process, which is a very complex one. And also to focus on the creation and execution of these map roads, on these electoral map roads, how, how a map road, and the idea is to guarantee transparency and inclusion, because we know that these electoral processes are not simple. And also, the idea here is to improve these practices and to give a guidelines to give guidance to have a better communication channel in order to guarantee responsibility, commitment, as well as participation of those representative of those chosen and the civil society. So before going in depth, I would like just to send a reminder as the beginning, the good practices for for having a productive session. Please keep your microphones in mute. <laughs> it seems that Karen just got frozen, so she's back. So let me start again on the good practices that we will follow up in this webinar. This is The idea is to keep your microphones muted once you are not participating and to keep the background noise as low as possible whenever you are participating, and also to respect the opinion of the others. There are several spaces in the next two hours during this activity, and also we will have a Q&A session. However, you are free to use the chat box also to introduce yourselves and to give your comments, to ask your questions throughout these two hours. But if you prefer to open your microphone, you can also raise your hand. You can use the, emoji, the icon of the raise hand, and this session will be it's been recorded for you to have it available on, on the website. And also for you, if you want to, to reply, to, to look it again. And finally, this session, it's also being enabled with interpretation, English and Spanish. So we will have one uh, speaker who will be speaking in English. So kindly, I kindly ask you to choose the channel, the Spanish channel for you to listen to the interpretation so you can hear the whole session in Spanish and the translation. So in order for you to have access to the simultaneous interpretation, click in the world icon down down below and then choose the language to, of your preference. If you are also on your cell phone, click on the three dots in the below area in the right right hand side of your cell phone. So without further notice then May I welcome you to the session, and then I will give the floor to Miriam Leal. She is the Associate Specialist from the CCM Hub to speak about regulations and guidelines of the Global Fund on the CCM's election process. So Miriam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here with, with you participating in, in this session of these electoral sessions for the CCMs in Latin America. So I would like to ask the LAC platform if I can share my screen 
so I can share. Do you want me to share the presentation? Yes, please. If, if you have them already there, please. We can start then. So as I was telling you through the Global Fund, it is, an, it is a pleasure to be here with you today and being able to talk about the member selections of the CCMs. As it was mentioned from the very beginning, this electoral process, this is a process that uh, are taken seriously and we would like to have a, a broadened participation and a transparent participation where all the members can be included through all this process. Next, please. So these are the, the agenda, this is the agenda, that, these are the points, the topics that I want to share. These are some dialogues, uh, expressions. And the first is to have a strategic, uh, and to speak about the strategy and the principles of the Global Fund. Later on, I will speak about the CCM, the CCM function that you may already have uh, well defined. And then just for those who don't have it, well, this is just a reminder these are the requirements, the eligibility requirements from one to six, and also how is it that the CCMs are being created, the expectations with regards to these elections, and key indicators of this uh, liability. So we would like to give a, a promotion of all these uh, points before going in depth on each one of them. So first, the strategy, the Global Fund strategy for 2023-2028, it is a focus and the main objective is to, to end the three pandemias, AIDS, TB and malaria. And this also having this approach together with the communities, the people to cover, to cover their, their, their health needs. One of the main objectives is to maximize this uh, community participation within the preparation of the of the grants through all the whole process of this. Also, it is centered on priorities to move towards that change and those elements uh, and the use of information, and also to improve the gender equity, health, health equity, and human rights. As you can see then, the three main objectives is to maximize the health systems, to maximize community participation and leadership of communities from those who are most affected, and to maximize equity as of health matters, gender equity, and human rights. As you may know, the Global Fund has uh, several main principles. But we would like to focus on these four main uh, principles. These are defined uh, as follows. Diversity and association. In this, in this point, we would like to cover diversity of all the members that can participate in the CCMs. That could be from different sectors, the public sector, the private sector, also from the civil society, as well as affected people from the diseases. And also from the private se sector that wants to work together or that has um, principles in order to coordinate with a country. The participation from the country, that the main idea is to have a coordination, a national coordination with the country and also to have uh, an approach of the grants of the national programs that can be complemented each one, each to other, and also to, to support and to strengthen the fight against the three diseases. So mainly here, the voices, the voices are also indispensable from all the communities. So we want all of them to feel that commitment so they can participate and that they can feel also this inclusion approach. So what do we mean by these uh, country coordinated mechanisms? The CCMs are national committees that are responsible of uh, submitting the financing request to the Global Fund 
and to supervise all the grants uh, on, on behalf of their countries. This is a key element of this Global Fund Association. And as you already know, the coordination mechanism includes several representatives from all the sectors. What are the tasks? What are the tasks of the country coordinated mechanisms? Well, mainly, primarily, they need to include the representatives of the, of the grants to assign a main recipient to monitor strategically the execution of these grants that are approved and also to approve several uh, requests, revision requests, and also to promote coherence between the grants of the Global Fund and other national health programs and of development. What, what is it that the CCMs do? As you had participated in the CCMs and know, and being able to understand the life cycle of a ground. But mostly, I would like to reinforce that the CCMs had a, a great influence in all throughout the, the, the life of the, of the grant. Through all the cycle of the grant, basically, is to start the dialogue process, the dialogue within the country. So that is the main that, that is the first uh, process to start the grant. Then the CCMs uh, guide the development of the financing request and name the main recept recipients. So the, these, for this, they require to have this inclusion of all the members and not only the, the participants, not only the members, but also civil society participants to include their voices and to, to include also their purposes and requirements, just to be sure that they are included. Also, the CCM monitored are, are being monitored strategically on the execution of the grant throughout the implementation. And also, if there is the need to, to have several changes throughout the ground, in, within its implementation, then the CCMs are informed and then they can include, the, the, they are informed to approve several requests on replanning or rescheduling. So as I told you from the very beginning, the eligibility, eligibility requests for the CCMs are six and these are verified in two ways. The objective, the eligibility of objectives one and two are verified at the moment that as they are requesting the grant. This eligibility requirement number one is referring to these transparent processes and inclusive processes on the elaboration of the financing request. So what is it that, what, what do we refer by that? Well, we need to be sure that the whole process, that the financing process is transparent is, and, it is, and it is also inclusive and that all the people involved have been included, all, all those who are interested from the civil society or also from the affected populations that are included or for pe people living with the, the three diseases. So that all these point of views are included within this uh, transparent and inclusive process. As for objective number two, it requires to be a transparent process and documented process on the selection of the main receptors. And this requires that, uh, that requires a transparent process also, but it has to be documented. And also that it is a good selection of the principal recipient and that this is also validated transparently. And now, as for the eligibility requirements from objectives three to six, these are verified throughout the financing process, and they are also being uh, verified at the moment of submitting the proposal. As for requirement number three, the idea is to monitor strategically the execution of the grants. That means that we need to have this monitoring of the strategies. 
this 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 is a monitoring that it's been reviewed strategically how is it that the grants are moving forward so as for requirement number four as for the eligibility of requirement number four uh, it is needed to have a transparent and documented representation of those affected communities and people who live with the, the three diseases and also for and the, the objective five on, on this eligibility requirement, these elections uh, should be documented and transparent of the non-governmental members. And in this case, we will focus a little bit more within the process of this uh, webinar to see, to see exactly what do we mean by documented elections and transparent elections of those non-governmental members. And also, for the representation of those affected communities and those who live with these three diseases. And finally, eligibility requirement number six refers to develop and to follow policies to manage those interest conflicts from all the members of the CCMs and to add to the ethics code of conduct. So throughout the process, throughout the process that it was being reviewed since uh, three years back, it started in twenty in two thousand and then two thousand twenty from two thousand twenty three. So we have three three more three four areas of responsibility from the CCMs. So the idea is to strengthen and to have a good, a healthy governance and sustained governance. As for these four areas on the responsibility of the CCMs uh, have. We can mention strategic monitoring, participation, positioning, and operations. So, in this case, we want to we will uh, focus the presentation in the second point, participation, and that means that all the constituent sectors should be effectively represented, and they should participate actively in these governance processes. And the idea here is to guarantee that these investments from the Global Fund are designed and implemented in a transparent way, in an inclusive way also, and that they go beyond that, that they can reach those who are affected and the most affected ones. Throughout this process and throughout this evolution process, uh, key indicators Performance key indicators were designed for the CCMs as well as the participation. And the participation objectives indicators that I would like to highlight here are the following. The first one refers to the fact that the CCMs should include those process and uh, selection processes, the mechanism. These should be also uh, ruled by good governance principles, they should be transparent, ethical, and they need to be well documented. And in that sense, that guarantee the quality of the participation of all the sectors involved. The second key indicator refers to the fact that those constituent sectors from the CCM participate and collaborate in the within the processes of the Global Fund. And this is not only This is not only th throughout the national participation processes, but also throughout the process of the whole grant. The CCM members, especially those from civil society, carry out activities to request uh, any fees or to, to give observations to their constituent sectors. And this is more focused on this uh, be direction and communication in order to contribute to the solid decision making process. And the final, the last key indicator, performance key indicator that has been reviewed annually, says that uh, members of the CCM, especially from civil society, must participate in the country processes, mainly in the national response. That is to say, strategic planning or the revision and the prioritization of the programs, or it could be also in the planning in the country of those that are associated for development aspects. 
In this slide, I would like to show you to show you the preliminary uh, results that we have seen throughout the evolution based on the key performance indicators, the participation uh, indicators. So basically, we want to mention that for the Latin American region, we can say that it is above the commitment level with regards of the electoral processes and the good governance. So what does that mean? Well, it means that currently the CCMs in Latin America, we can say that in average, they are uh, committed in a 60% more. And this is a good, this is a good indicator because they are engaged and uh, that means that the election process processes are, uh, do respect a good governance. They are well executed and they are transparent. And furthermore, they are well documented. Also, these preliminary results show that there is a good level of commitment within the general process of the Global Fund. That means that there is a good level of participation with regards of the processes from the Global Fund. And an, an additional point here that I would like to mention is that the Latin American and the Caribbean region, we can say that it is found in a functional level with regards of this bidirectional communication. So this is uh, something that we can work on and improve in the next in the next couple of months. Now let's uh, talk about the expectations with regards of this election process from the CCMs. As it was mentioned, there are three different uh, processes that the CCM use according to the sectors. It could be by assignation, it could be by selection, or it could be by election. So in this case, it is important to consider which representatives from the government, civil society, private sector, or other representatives can, can offer more to the decision-making process of the CCMs with regards um, on the role and the importance of these uh, sectors and the priorities of the grants. So as for assignation on a regular basis, it's the governmental sector who designs, who, sorry, who assigns its members and there's to the health ministry or the education ministry. Each CCM assign their own members and once that they are assigned each sector, then they assigned who will be the representatives within the CCM. By selection process, on a regular basis, the multilateral and bilateral partners choose their members and their alternates who will represent them within the mechanism. This is a selection that it's been done within these multilateral and bilateral organizations, and they are chosen, they, they are chosen to be represented in the CCM. And finally, the election process. Usually that means to those to these selections from the civil society, the private sector, key populations, people who live with the diseases, and they are the ones who choose the CCMs. They choose the members of the CCMs through an ethical process, well-documented, well-published, and transparent process that is based in the good governance principles of the CCMs. So, in general, what are the expectations with regards to the elections of the CCMs? It is important to highlight here and to mention that the elections of the CCM, each CCM has their own process, and this process, on a regular basis, it's included in their governance documents. So that's one, that's one general principle, but the expectations that we have as for the global as from the global fund are focused on principles and good practices that we have seen throughout the years as for the principles we we, we refer to the that it has to be a well documented processes 
That is to say that each step has to be documented. It has to be also broadly uh, published. There has to be a publication within the websites as well as within their WhatsApp groups or in, the so in their social media. It has to be transparent. And also, all the members should know the process. They should know how to participate and how to be included. That, that is the point of being included, inclusive. Inclusi and for those members who have participated before, then if they are new members and if they are curious and they have the need to participate, they should be included also. So as for the good practices, we have seen that whatever that we have seen that works properly for the CCMs is that when on a regular basis, when they have a electoral manual well defined, they have a roadmap of the electoral process. So what does the roadmap mean? Well, this is a calendar where it is defined exactly when will happen, what will happen, and how will happen. There is also, we have seen also that when the CCMs execute uh, or run their elections in a good manner or with good following good practices, usually they have an electoral registry where they know, they know the organizations that are interested and they can also integrate new organizations. We have also seen that uh, another another good practice is that when there are uh, ad hoc observers, it helps that there is a transparent process. It also help, helps that the electoral committee can define the whole process, can be useful or can be like the facilitator of the process and also to support whenever is needed. Whenever the technical support is needed or maybe a possible recommendation throughout the process. Also, when there is like a broad uh, call of several candidates and when this uh, broadened uh, call gives this eligibility and then how is it that those candidates will be assessed or how is it that a candidate is being assigned as a valid candidate. There should also be a verification of the eligibility and the certification of the candidates and being um, and it has been uh, and, and the, the, the voting process is being defined also how is if it will be like a secret or an open book voting process. All of this, it's been well communicated before and during the, the election process. So we have seen that all these uh, good practices work and they work properly and help the members to achieve an election process broad and transparent and inclusive, and usually with good results. And so finally, I just want to share how, how is it that currently the members of the CCMs are represented here. So these are just preliminary statistics that we have in the system. These are self-reported data, but on a regular basis, a CCM is being formed between 25 and 18 members. In average, this is the number of members of all the CCMs. This is the global average. So as you can see, there are CCMs that are a little bit smaller, but they are uh, broad, depending according to their national context. And also, if they are planning for the three grants or if they are only focused on one. So that is this is the context of each country. And finally, I would like to share with you that there are several resources and tools that are available for you on how to expand the civil society participation or from those people that are affected and those who live with the three diseases. 
So these are the material. Or here you can see several reports that are useful for you to, to your CCM, for you to how to improve your election, your own election process, or this can, this can be also used as a guide within your grant process. Let me finish with this idea, and I think that we will leave the questions at the end, right? Yes, thank you so much, Miriam. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it seems that many people are asking for that, and also we will include all the presentations in the webinar, in the website, and they are asking if we can have the presentation in, in English. I know that within the agenda, we have three different blocks of participation. As for the time being, let's just keep it, and then Let's give the Q&A to the moment that we will have. So now I would like to speak about these uh, processes. These processes that we are having today, what are the, the experiences, that the past experiences within these mechanisms, within these good practices, and as well as the lessons, lessons learned. Lessons learned. What happens, for example, when a when a uh, process is more complex uh, compared with another country, for example? So, so for that, we invited two two people, one from Jamaica and the other one from Colombia, so they can share with us their experiences and their lessons learned. So, I would like to give the floor then also to Tameka Cloud. She was the consultant who worked together in all these uh, processes. So if you can let us know exactly how is it that you adapted to this, to include it in Jamaica, to include the populations, key, the key populations, and what are the lessons learned that we can include in other contexts? So, Tamika, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, everyone hearing me? Yes. Great. Sí. Se escucha bien. Sí. Yes. Awesome. Okay, so Jamaica's experience um, was very different in the last um, CCM elections for key pops. What changes were made, um, we made it more, it was a more democratic process. So previously, what used to happen, we used to get all the key population groups together in a meeting physically, and this would have been um, obviously before COVID. And so we would get them in a room together and the election process would have been explained to them and they would have been asked to vote. So everything would have happened or occurred over a one day period. Now, what happened is that we made sure to make it a more democratic process. And of course, we had um, the recommendations out of the Columbia process, which would have encouraged um, more preparation in terms of providing information to the organizations. Um, an election register would have been prepared because the CCM didn't have a current list. So we had to ensure that we had a current list of all the key population groups, whether they were on the CCM or not. So all CCMs across Jamaica were invited, regardless of whether they were on the CCM. And we had a call for nominations or self nominations because of the size of the, the country, we couldn't, we didn't have that many key population organizations. So we had to implement um, self nomination also for candidates to sit on the CCM for the key pop group. Um, verification of eligibility and certification of nominees was also done by the team, including myself and the consultants, and campaigning was done. So campaigning was done over a 24 hour period after the persons were certified. And so that would require them to submit their nominations to their constituents. And then voting would have happened again on the 28th over the 29th of December, right before Christmas or right after Christmas, sorry. They got 24 hours to vote. And so those were, those were sent in electronically. So as I said, the difference would have been they would have met physically in a room over a one day period. Now the difference is we're doing it electronically over several days. 
And then we would have counted, a committee would have been formed and we would have done counting of the nominations and an official announcement would have been made um, of the elected representative. And so this process, um, although within a very tight, tight time frame and done electronically for the first time, um, it was very efficient because we had all the information um, put together in documentation and all of this was sent out to the constituents and all the organiz organizations that participated in the process. So what this allowed for was if there were any issues, persons could submit questions, which we were available to clarify. And so as part of the transparent and democratic part of the process, this um, the constituents found um, very important for them to be informed and make better decisions. Um, so going forward, um, we would recommend that uh, instead of a one day process where persons are advised um, at a meeting and then asked to present after their votes for counting that the information goes ahead. So you'll find that you'll have new members joining organizations over time and they would not have participated in the process previously. So this would then allow them to have documentation and information about how the process um, is to go, about the candidates that are being put forward and nominated for the process. And so they would have more time to make an informed decision. What used to happen is that where new persons were placed in the room and they were not sure of the candidates, they would have to go to somebody and ask them, do you know this person? What have they done? Um, I'm new to the group. Um, tell me about them. So this, the time that was allowed in this process um, facilitated persons to make more informed decisions about who they wanted to represent them because persons had to meet certain criteria. Um, they had to um, be able to communicate and advocate and demonstrate that they have um, experience in advocating for um, the needs and rights of persons. Um, they would have had to demonstrate that they actually are a part of an organization um, where they work, which community they work in, um, what um, activities they have conducted um, towards improving the lives of key populations. And so they would have had to get this information um, ahead of time to make um, more informed decisions. And of course, they would have had access to myself and to the other consultants to clarify any questions about the, the JCCM process um, in terms of how the elections were to go and any documentation. And we provided them with a roadmap um, about the entire process, you know, to provide transparency and of course, guarantee meaningful involvement of all the stakeholders. So um, in summarizing, um, my takeaways from the process would have been for the CCM number one to have a current list and to update the key population list whether with the CCM um, or not, just an entire um, list of key population groups across the island um, that is current. And so this can be done you know, frequently, for example, every six months it's updated, whether it's um, a new head of the entity or contact information um, or a new group added to the list. Just like when you go to the bank and they ask you for your banking details, they'll ask you, have you changed your phone number recently? Can we get an update? So to engage um, key populations to ensure that the list is up to date so that when um, the time comes that we'll have a current list to operate from, um, of course, the time crunch was a challenge, but we executed, um, we organized and scheduled all the activities um, appropriately. So everything was done, um, you know, succinctly. And of course, we would have, of course, wanted the nominated individuals to have um, mobilized the, the constituents. Of course, there was one organization that had most of or a person from an organization that had mobilized significantly from their organization so apparently they had a very current list of uh, members um, that had nominated that individual and that person was nominated overall as a CCM representative 
But um, yes, my takeaways, those are my takeaways from that process. And uh, to note that the, elect the electronic process, although we're outside of COVID now, that the electronic process can work, especially when you have a, uh, another um a time crunch or even if you have another pandemic that um we can still have a democratic process um for elections thank you muchas gracias tamika thank you so much tamika thank you so much for sharing the process held in jamaica which has not been simple there has been many obstacles to face mm -hmm. and also we were Speaking about that on, on Wednesday, these are great lessons learned for the next uh, process, not only for Jamaica, but for any other obstacle that they raise from um, Latin America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So we, in the chat box, I'm also sharing the toolbox in Spanish and in English for you to download it and read it. And also, within this experience of lessons learned, we wanted to know the process held in Colombia. So for that, we have Dr. Hannah now. She's the president elected of the CCM for her to speak about the challenges and the outcomes as for the election process in Colombia. So for her to tell us her experience within the process. So, Dr. Ana, I give you the floor. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Hopefully you can see it now. Yes, we can see it. Let me just uh, zoom it out. Now, there it is. Yes, we can see it. Okay, so let me thank you, especially for inviting me today. For us, it is important to share this experience within this initial exercise for Latin America, within these democratic election processes from those who participate from the civil society in, in this process. My name is Ana Enau. I'm president of the Coordinating, coordinating Mechanisms from Colombia. I would like to greet Anwar, Alfredo Mejia, Osvaldo Rada. I see him connected also. And my colleague, uh, William, William Porras, he's the technical secretary of the mechanism. Also, at Stolo, who is here and all the people who are uh, who joined this session thank you so much for wanting to listen to this experience so this is just a brief agenda i will speak about the background of this electoral process then i will discuss the electoral process as such i will talk about the outcomes and finally the lessons learned so as background i can tell you we received a technical assistance and it was guided by ICATO and was supported by the Global Fund. So through this uh, technical assistance, we wanted to have the strengthening of those participants from the civil society, from the based community organizations, and when, as well as on the key populations and those uh, vulnerable populations also within the coordinated mechanism within the process of the Global Fund in Colombia. I remember that 20 years ago, that since I started my my job as a researcher within the area, there were several c conditions, and all of them affected affect the pe the population with more with more vulnerability living with these conditions. So I remember, and I recall that whenever we look for the financing, I just read on the global fund, and that there was that this possibility for Colombia to to obtain those resources, but that was a closed process from the very beginning with difficult access. And at that time, I was not able to reach this in an effective manner. 
was not able to have access at least to have a dialogue or to reach a conversation. So in that sense, it is so nice and beautiful to see how that right now, throughout this governance uh, position, I can say that the processes within the CCM in Colombia are open and we also look to have a more meaningful participation, not only from the community, but also from key populations. So the, the, this is how, as Miriam uh, was uh, speaking about the, the whole process on the election election process of these uh, country meca coordinating mechanisms. In 2018, in Colombia, we have this uh, initiative we tried to include the inclusive and the commitment positioning aligned with all these national uh, strategies uh, with the governance as well and the mechanisms of these priority countries pri prioritized by the global fund. So in that sense, we were able to identify the particular needs on the functioning and the ideas on, within the mechanism on how they government, as well as on the aspects that are related with the strategic monitoring. So in that sense, we find some outcomes from this technical assistance that gives lead to these electoral processes. And then those products uh, referred to the updating of the internal regulation. That's been useful, and I also I'm grateful for receiving this uh, MCP with an updated internal regulation and with clear objectives for these ethical and governance committees with a committee of uh, interest conflict, which is a, an important requirement to be eligible for the CCM. Also, Another outcome from this technical assistance received, we have a directory of all the members and we have a communications guide. And so we can have this by bidirectional communication that is needed. This, for this, we, we still need a strengthening in, the, in that sense because communications can be clearly described, but we can say that these are very complex processes. We all know we all know how these communication processes can impact uh, broadly the way that we relate each to other. And in that sense, we require to have uh, several resources so we can be able to achieve communication and assertive communication. Chat, como it was also mentioned in the chat box, the greatness on these uh, territories and the availability of resources, it's not the same. And I'm just speaking about these technological resources, of course, because that makes that uh, communication sometimes are complex. So even the way on, on calling the proposals uh, makes it a little complex and also to create this uh, meaningful participation. So that's how I want to call the attention of this important point on the communications that are defined not only at the inside of the of the of the group, but also within the the communities that are represented, and also among the representatives, as it was mentioned in the chat, within the populations also that are included in the mechanism. So another one is an update of the of the new of the of this uh, agreement 1543. This is internal. This is from the country. Another one is the protocol for the guidance of the new members. At that point, it is important. Later on, I will explain and I will tell you in which stage we are at as citizens. Right now, we're implementing this protocol to give a guidance to the new members and also to give this uh, guidance and the presentation and the approval of those representatives from the key populations. So then the electoral process is run in the country based on this technical assistance that uh, proposes several strategies to promote participation. And as main objectives of this communication strategy, the idea was not only to call the participation, but also to get to know about the processes of the global fund and the, the, the processes of the coordinating mechanism. 
maybe later uh, before I, as i told you this was an isolated process but now what we're looking for is to expand and to increase the knowledge and to promote the functions of the mechanisms as well as those possibilities to have this a great and true participation that's why we we ask for having this representation so in that sense we have this participation from civil society and mainly from the key population within the mechanism through through these uh, democratic uh, transparent and clear processes so therefore some ways on how to render responsibility and that are clear on what i mentioned within these guidelines for the participation and approval. So we developed three communication strategies. The first one, we, we developed these informative capsules with regards to the processes of the Global Fund in Colombia, and they were uh, broadcasted throughout the country in Colombia, so they get to know about them. So civil society was informed and they knew and whatever they want to, whomever wanted to know about uh, the Global Fund process and within the, the process, they, they these capsules inform about that. Then we also run these virtual sessions, informative sessions, but because of the of the greatness of the country and not having access to virtual effects, we organize also offline informative sessions, visiting the cities with more with the highest prevalence, uh, mainly of HIV. So we can have a dialogue face to face with those who participate in the answer from the civil society in all these cities. Also to, to clarify or to get to know about the knowledge of the challenges and inform them on in, in, an, in an effective way and inviting them also to be part of this electoral process. So for that, we developed a map road for the election of representatives and the idea was to participate on this decision-making process where communities have their voice and an effective participation. So Alfredo now will speak about this roadmap that later on uh, we consider that this is an important tool to guarantee that the whole process is done in a transparent manner. So basically is to speak about this uh, call on the registration of the civil society of the community-based organizations, and then later on, thanks that these committees being defined. So we just verify the requirements through these post, uh, to the, through the post, postulants, and then there was like an electronic uh, voting process. Then we do the, the counting of the vote, then we have this final act where the elected ones were defined and mentioned there. So we cover all these requirements as for the global fund with regards to the strengthening and, and our capabilities to run all these processes. And also finally, a notification and communication of these new of the, on the creation of the country coordinated mechanism. So for that, let me speak a little bit more on those requirements. So how can a candidate can be postulated a representation of the civil society organizations? So for that, it needs to have a permanent updating process. So each country should be included in the phase so they can know exactly what is it that it is the best, what is it needed. So at its moment, we talk about a minimum experience uh, that can be the, that, that can be proved within the group of the population of two years, and then the minimum minimum working with HIV and TB. I represent people living with TB, and in in my country, which I feel it's it is like um, I can say that. There is, whenever we say that uh, we represent more than 20,000 people in a national territory, so I can say that the 2,000, 3,000 people 
that are affected by TB and are useful to support those needs and those requirements so I can understand their, from their own experiences. So, as I said before, this needs a permanent updating. And what are the skills and what are the abilities that are required, that are needed? How is it that I verify that these uh, activities are effective from these people that are being postulated, that they are truly uh, respectful individuals, that they have these leadership uh, skills, that they can handle the conflict of interest and negotiation abilities? Now let me speak a little bit more of how, what is it that we expect from the elections? What are the lessons? We had some other requirements also. It is important to be available on time because as you know, the CCM doesn't pay. I mean, it's only the participation. The only is the participation to support the response in the country, but not being paid monetarily can be complex because that implies that it has to, it, it, it implies a lot of time and a lot of work. And also we as activists, we have those possibilities, but that that makes a little complex also. The idea is also to have this availability to participate in the induction processes and to develop this commitment letter uh, where they include the experience and leaderships and also to certify the experience from an organization that they had been, uh, yes, uh, linked to, and also to represent the community and to be postulated as part of the key populations uh, within the country. So in the case of Colombia, we are speaking about of MSM, trans people, people who live with HIV, men and women, uh, people who inject or use drugs, also people who live in the streets, sex workers or those people affected with the TB and their representatives. So therefore we have several uh, difficulties within the process that I would like to highlight here. So as for the participation and the registration of civil society organizations, I can say that it was low. Uh, knowing about the expansion of the of the national territory. So for that, we consider that that can be improved. And I think that through all these two years where I have been able to participate in the actions within the mechanism, we've been uh, working on that. We've been keeping working on, on informing the, the territories by having visits. And a second difficulty that we want to mention is that there's not enough representatives that are available in all, in all the sectors. For example, a, one particularity is that one thing is that they have that they are related with us with the grants, and that means that they do not uh, postulate themselves on the representation within the mechanisms. So, or sometimes we have these postulates candidates that do not comply with all the requirements needed, and also sometimes they require to have uh, or they should have. They should have better condition with regards of reading or access to technological um, tools. So this is still another topic that has to be considered, another issue to be considered. Also, the lack of devices with regards of communication. And finally, the lack of trust in the mechanism. And this might be because of the story that they have had within the coordinated mechanisms. Maybe because they are not aware of the functions of the CCM, and I know that in, in other countries also they have some issues uh, like similar to this one in our country. And that's based on how is it that the main recipient? It could be it might seem that uh, he or she is a leader that goes beyond the of the mechanism and the key population. So that is the that lack of knowledge. How is it that it should work? How to improve then this uh, lack of confidence? As for the results, the results are as follows, more or less: 157 organizations, the civil society, and community-based organizations working with HIV and TB throughout the national territory. All of them were registered for the voting process. 44 out of them 
belong to the civil society organization based uh, community based organization, 34 from NSN, 27 from the trans people, 26 from people living with HIV, 17 representing or on, on behalf of uh, sex workers, people who live in the streets and people who use drugs, and finally, people affected by TB are nine. So this is like the first registry of the organizations that were there before postulating the candidate. So then after that, this, this whole process was done through a Google Forms sheet. And we also did the promotion through the link of, of registration through email, WhatsApp, social media. On, on the other side and the presentation so far. So that's how, that's how we obtain this database with this organization registered to create this electoral uh, registration. So we have, as uh, positive outcomes, we were able to give the priority to the key populations rather than the networks that, as it was used before before there were networks who were in the country, who were present within the, the processes through all the story of the mechanism. And now the priority was given to key populations. It was uh, basically focused on, on that. We also had a better participation from different sectors and territories. And this is important also to take it into consideration because of what I mentioned uh, before because of the, of the greatness of the national territory. We also spoke about the importance of the positioning of the CCM in CCM, all these electoral processes, the possibilities to articulate leaders on the, on the terrain, to identify new, new leaders or to identify youth who were not involved previously. So now with youth, they can have this possibility to have, to have more uh, better participation. And also it is important the strengthening of the skills of the civil society organization as well as the community-based organizations. We also have the participation from all these sectors that we had already mentioned. So there were six representatives from the civil society on, from HIV and two representatives from the TB response in the country. So within the mechanism, eight of the representations were participating participations come from the civil society. As for lessons learned, I want to highlight that it has to be updated on those registrations for those people belonging to the key populations. And this is an open issue that has to be stimulated in, among, among all the territories as well as among and all these uh, contexts. And what are those meeting points? What are those uh, work spaces? What are the health services that they go through? What are the community spaces and their work sessions to organize and to, let's say, by subsectors in order to improve that registration so then we can see that we have a better participation of civil society and the populations. Also, it has to be updated the prioritizations of the populations. We have an outcome here, and we have an optimal study of this technical assistance given, where it is evident that uh, those who are private uh, from the freedom is important to include that to focus approaches with MSM as well as with migrant population. And we, we spoke about that because within the mechanism, there is no representation from this particular interests of these uh, two populations. So that's why this update process has to be on a permanent basis. As for the adjustment of the profiles in the terms of reference, uh, we need to define what is that profile. How can we assure that those monitoring processes, as well as on these liability and weather of accounts processes, can be, or what are those skills that are needed? from the participants to be sure and to offer this uh, render of uh, responsibility processes accurate ones in these uh, spaces. So I think that these terms of reference should be adjusted according to the experiences that we have had. In that case, we, need, we think that there is more experience needed and there is more that it should be 
more contact with the key population. Also, uh, communicative trends are crucial and also to have like this response and to have those arguments based on the data and to run this uh, advocacy process and based on this true knowledge and based on data from the from those population that they represent or from those who participate. So speaking about the lessons learned as for communication, strategies should be uh, expanded, they should be varied, and they should have they should be a PC access in order to promote them and to persist in the CCM and to get to know about this electoral process. Because as we said, it also has to be based in the IT technologies and communication technologies to improve uh, on-site or off-site, sorry, to improve off-site meetings outside the whole territory. And we also highlight the importance of increasing the confidence processes to improve these uh, off-site uh, sessions, also trying to look to have this guarantee and the representation of new keeper populations and prioritized populations. And also, to have a meaningful participation. It is also important, going a little bit back with this topic of communications, to mobilize financial resources for developing this data communication plan. Because as I was telling you, so I represent 20 people affected by TB in my country, but I do not have these economic resources to do so, then I don't have a community manager that can go with me together for that process. So all, all the things that imply to have an effective communication with these populations will be difficult. Communication won't be of this high quality rather than having these resources that are defined to improve those processes, not only within the CCM, but also outside it. So we kept on working on, on having this meaningful participation within the CCM in Colombia. We know that we will have to, uh, later on, we will have a Q&A session that I hope my colleague Osvaldo Rada can share about that, and also Alfredo Mejia. So thank you so much for inviting me. And here we, we can we keep on the presentation. Por la gran detallada thank you so much, Dr. Henao. Thank you so much for highlighting all those points and all those processes that need to be improved. Thank you for sharing these lessons learned and recommendations. So whenever these processes are done, what is that it's missing and what has to be improved. Also, it is important to highlight this roadmap that you mentioned. And this is something that we wanted to give an emphasis, as we told you from the very beginning. We want that these sessions not only to be informative, but also to be educative and informative. So we invite now Alfredo. He's not only the one who was there in the Colombian process, but also he's one of the ones who made happy to make to make possible to have this toolbox. So if you can please uh, tell us how to develop these roadmaps for these democrat for having the democratic elections and to have these communication processes for rendering the accounts. What should we what should be included in the roadmap? How can we guarantee that this electoral process is transparent? So what do you recommend also how to define these mechanisms and these communication channels, how to have them, uh, how to be more efficient, and how can we guarantee for this render of uh, responsibility and how to design it, how to develop. So now I give the floor to Alfredo Mejia. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good evening, everyone, everybody. So yes, effectively, I was involved together with some other colleagues with the CCM and with other members who were interested in this adventure to, pro to run an electoral process being democratic, transparent, and participative also from those members from the communities of the CCM in Colombia. As for this experience, a, a tool 
was developed and it was it has been already shared in the chat box and as Miriam mentioned uh, Taneka mentioned it also so I will speak a little bit about this timeline about this roadmap and also give some recommendations on how to create it so before that I would like to mention that all the countries are different and all the dynamics from the civil society organizations and within their relationships and internal and with other actors are different. Also, the sizes of the countries are different. So therefore, this roadmap is only a model where you can take ideas or several elements, one or several elements or just adapt it to the reality of each country. So let me tell you, I will speak, I will start with these guidelines on the the design and implementation of this roadmap to choose a representative of civil society organizations and the key population from country colonial mechanisms in our country and in our regions. So for that, let's start speaking about what is a roadmap. A roadmap, a roadmap is a document that shows the detailed scheduling and planning of the necessary activities in order to achieve an objective. So in this case, the objective is to develop a process of transparent elections, democratic elections and participative, as well as well documented from the representatives of the OCTS and the key populations. All of them should be included in this roadmap. Miriam spoke about those, and that makes it a little bit complex. The roadmap is also a source of information that has to be agreed and shared. This has been described uh, together. This is not only done by the consultant, but also it has to be developed through the members of the CCM and other uh, actors that are interested in the process. And this uh, source of information describes the objectives, the priorities, the steps, and the progress of the process. And it has to be on time, timely, and anticipated. This is truly important because it might change throughout the time. Communities and people that are interested, they should be informed before the steps are developed of this roadmap. And it is also uh, directed to the broad and diverse uh, people that are interested in the process. That, that's why it has to be in a simple and easy language. Some of the characteristics of this roadmap should show the general vision of the process, the objectives, the tools, the, the activities. It has to be flexible because, as I said, for each country, the process is different. At least the experience in Colombia showed that it was needed to be adjusted throughout the road. It has to be shared with different and in several interested actors. It has to be participative, I already mentioned, and it has to be clear and concise. So what has to be defined? It has to be defined. Define why the election process is, is taking place. And there you include all the requirements from the Global Fund as well as the importance of the community's participation. And then it has to include also the objectives, what is it that we pretend to achieve with this roadmap. The activities need to be uh, described also and the principles that guide the process. So, in general terms, we can say that it is being described in this timeline the stages, the minimum stages that a roadmap should include. There has to be an initial stage on information and communication. It has to be followed by the call of uh, proposals, then the registration of those who will be who will vote, and then the postulations, the verification on the requirements of those who are postulated, then the election stage and the voting process itself, the notification process finally, and the induction stage of those who were elected. So let's try to see each one of these stages in detail. As for the information communication stage, this is a strategy, a communication strategy. As, and as such, it has to be identified which is a population that we are guiding the messages to. So we need to realize that our countries also, the movements, the organizations, all the groups are diverse and different. So we need to optimize exactly what are the contents that should be identified and what are the most effective channels, communication channels, so their messages are reached. And communication has to be crossed out not only for the roadmap, but also for the whole electoral process. We always need to be informing. As for the call of proposal stage, the idea is to inform exactly why is it that it's going to be done, how, and what are the rules of the game. So 
And uh, this is part of the communication strategy. It is focused to those interested. It should be one or several sessions, depending on the number of factors that are interested at a national level. They could be virtual or off offline or mixed. If they are virtual, then it is uh, recommended to guarantee that all the participants can connect, that they have uh, data and that they can have the resources to join the sessions. And it is also advisable to record the sessions and to share with those of them who were not able to, to, to join. If we have a offline sessions, some memory guides and attendance lists should be also recorded to document the whole process. Moving on with these uh, informative sessions on the call of proposals, so some communities, as Hannah was uh, speaking about, they prefer to have these offline sessions. So those need to be scheduled on time. They need to be scheduled in advance so they can program themselves and they, can, they should include the criteria. Here we have an example of the contents that uh, for their sessions, they need to include the criteria of the participations of the organizations and the candidates. The, should and should the do's and, and should not do to choose or to be chosen the profile of the candidates and basic information because also it seems that the the basis for those who are not in the ccm they lack knowledge on the global fund as well as on the ccm so and also having these uh, input and output uh, assessments uh, that is to say the information that we're sharing is there with the populations then we have the voting registration stage or the development of an electoral registry. This is just the list with a preliminary register that includes information of individuals or organizations that have been registered and that are unable to choose their representative through all this CCM mechanism through a vote. The function of this electoral registry is to get to know the universe of voters guarantee that each one of them emit only one vote, only a unique vote, avoiding to include more than one vote and to not allowing also to attribute votes who are not able to vote then, and to vote for a representative of that population or from that key population. In this case also we have the call of proposals for this uh, electoral registry. On a regular basis, we have a, an advanced list, but then we just promote the news. So maybe for those other organizations that do not have access, they can enroll in that registry. The call of proposals then should include all the requirements, clear requirements for those organizations and individuals can enroll and exercise their vote. Their vote. This is a key message in all the communication strategies. They can use a Google form for registration. A period of time has to be defined with a deadline so then organizations and individuals can register. These messages, this is a lesson learned. Reminder messages should be sent to all the members so they registered at the end of this registration process. Then it has to be verified that all of those who register comply with all those requirements. And then it is defined the electoral registration in a database for the individuals and organizations that can vote. Then we have the postulation of the candidates. In this case, it has to be defined if, the, if it's been defined by the electoral registry or if they can self uh, postulate. On a regular basis, these two options are being considered as these are innovative. So this uh, call of proposals should define the requirements and the profile of the candidates. They should include key messages. It has to be a key message to be informed within this communication strategy. It could also be done through email, adjusting all the support information, all the documents. That is to say that all of them comply with the requirements that were defined previously. It has to be uh, also, a deadline has to be defined and also reminders should be sent. Now, then we have a verification process. That is to say that all those who were postulated, if they comply with the requirements, and the, so those have to be reviewed. And that is the role from the election committee. It has been mentioned already. It has an important role on follow up the, the process. And then after the 
postulation closes, they need to verify if they comply with this committee. And that's the ad hoc committee. A card or a, an electoral board has to be designed, including the names and the picture of the candidates per sector. The information of the candidates should be promoted within the organizations that belong to this electoral registration. And this process has to be documented in an act, and then it has to be signed by the members of this election committee. This is an example of the boards that were sent. And close to each picture, there was a message of each one of the candidates for their they were telling why we should vote for them. And here you see on the left-hand side, the step by step to issue their vote, their vote. Afterwards, once that those candidates were approved, then we we followed the electoral campaign stage. In that case, those accredited candidates are in contact with their voter voters. We give a period. In this case, it was one week. They can use different mean of com means of communication to contact their voters. They can organize virtual or offline meetings. And it has to be reviewed also because another lesson learned that I have kind of mentioned, not all the candidates and not all the organizations ha were having the same conditions to participate in the process. So those who do not have the best conditions need to be supported and also a deadline has to be assigned. After that, then we have this... Uh, stage on the voting process, a date has to be defined, and also clearly has to be described the voting process. For example, if it's done through the uh, email, or on a, on a regular basis, as our countries are big in size, this voting, this voting process, that the offline voting process can be a challenge. So the idea is that they only have to have one vote per candidate and they can be done only for one candidate to the population that they were registered. In this case also, the virtual boxes should have uh, be, they should be enabled through a specific period. And also it has to be clear that the, those votes who are there be, after the, that deadline, then they those not should not be con counted. And then after that, immediately uh, afterwards, a meeting was organized with a ad hoc committee to count the votes. And then from this meeting, that the holders and the alternate will be accredited. And then an, an act should, of the outcomes should include the name of those who were elected by sector. And it has to be confirmed through an, an email that those are available for that position. So we're still here with the communication and the notification of the chosen one. It has to be uploaded to the website of the CCM, including the roadmap, the act of the electoral process signed by the ad hoc committee, the counting of the votes, and other additional information. An email should be sent, and as well as from other mechanisms to all those interested, included a link when they can have access to the information. And finally, the induction stage. In that case, a workshop of at least two days should be organized for the induction of the new representatives. It can also be offline or online, that according to the resources, and they should include an agenda covering all the interest topics, including also representatives from the OCS and PCMs, uh, so they can support in all these processes. And optionally, a communications plan from the civil society can be developed in, in the case that we are interested in this bidirectional communication between those who are chosen and those who voted for them. And just to finish here, some other recommendations in this slide. The communication mechanism should be defined in order to clarify any doubts or any inconformities. Those have to be timely responded. If there is any inconformity, it has to be taken to the ad hoc committee election process and then everyone should be, all should receive an answer, all the criteria should be resolved. In case a position is not there, then the CCM should inform about the process to follow. And each one of the activities should also have as a date and time if needed. 
So this is already in the chat box. These are the recommendations based on this experience. And as I told you, this can be used partially or totally or can be adapted to your countries. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We are great on time. Thank you, Alfredo, for sharing these great expertise that you have in all this process. So now I open the floor for any additional comment or questions. I know that Miriam, Miriam Lal just left, but here we still have Dr. Enao, Alfredo, Anuar, Osvaldo is there also. So if you have any questions about the process, Tameka is also there if you want to know a little bit more about Jamaica. So the floor is open now. In the meantime, let me tell you that the Spanish newsletter that was uh, distributed a few days ago, there were some comments from Ecuador and Colombia from the CCM. So if you want to know a little bit more about the process in Jamaica, the newsletter in English that will be launched tomorrow, there will, there's an, a note, we gave it so where we will speak about these lessons learned. So I see that there are some hands. I will give the floor to Tori Lucas. Thank you so much. Good day, everyone. I'm the Technical Secretariat of the CCM, Country Coordinating Mechanisms in Guatemala. I have one question. How, how is it that you handle the topic of the election of these of the representatives in the board of directors that handle the subrecipients of the grants of the global fund i'm interested on in that because in the last activity that we had to improve the ccm we needed to change two representatives who were from the key populations because according to the fund, they had this uh, conflict of interests for being subrecipients. However, we have the health ministry who is a subrecipient and he's also included in the board. So according to the fund, it can be, it can be there. I don't know to whom should I guide this question, Alfredo or Anuar or Tamika. Maybe the colleagues from the Global Fund are not here yet. So I think that that depends on the guidelines of the country coordinating mechanisms and the Global Fund. As for, the, as for Colombia, I think that there's a code of ethics that it won't allow the, part, the direct participation on the country me coordinating mechanisms of the subrecipients. So that way this can be answered. And in that case, the Health Ministry of Colombia is not subrecipient. So that depends on the particularities of each country. Thank you, Alfredo. And I think within the website of the platform lab, you can see the code of ethics of the CCM in Spanish and in English. Let me find out the link to share it with you. Anwar or any, anybody else would like to answer Doris' question, or if not, I give the floor to Gretel, Gretel Sam, Samoy. I would like to take the floor as technical secretary of the CCM in Colombia to answer this concern because as Alfredo says, it depends it depends on the context of the country as well as on the regulations of each CCM. In the CCM in Colombia, there's not an, an executive committee in the structure. The decision process is through a, a plenary assembly. And, and in the case that uh, there is this recipient, and if there is no receptor recipient on making this decision process, just to clarify. So it depends on the regulations of each CCM. Gracias. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for clarifying. And this is another speaking just to compliment. It is kind of complex to answer that question, Doris, because yes, it, it's, it's, it depends on different factors that are particular to each country. Basically, it is based on the uses and traditions of that country. But I think that it is important to highlight here, and it is important uh, for you to put this on the discussion, because I think that something that has to facilitate are those spaces where we can exchange experiences. It is true that each country solves uh, any situation in a different way, and in each country they have their own governance documents that support or that do, do not enable any decision. But I think that it is important that right now that uh, the CCM colleagues from Colombia are answering, it is important to have the references on how is it that they respond or how is it that these situations are, are limited and in many cases they create a lot of, uh, of confusion also. So it is clear to have to know exactly what are the clear mechanisms, how to use these governance documents. And I think that these are spaces that should be promoted. Most of the idea of, of this, mostly the idea of this webinar is exactly to get to know what are the lessons learned that we can take from each process. And that is why we try to include an experience from Latin America and the other one from the Caribbean so we can understand exactly those differences between the countries. So I do not have a, an answer. I do not have a concrete answer to your question, but I do recognize I do recognize that difficulty that my state a situation that you are sharing. So, so I think that right now, more than more than having a, a guidance or more than having a definite uh, answer to your question, I think that the most important and the most valuable thing here is that we are listening to that situation and that we are understanding that many times we need to be creative and that we need to have all the elements so we can solve a situation, challenging situations, just, just as the one that you are describing. And what happens is that this creates a... People are not con uh, happy with the with populations. Key populations are not happy because why? Why the main receptor can be the board also, and those who are the representative of key populations who have been chosen democratically cannot be part, cannot be represented in the board. So as it was seen, when, whenever there was a point that affected at this board or that it was proper to that organization or to the network, then they were kindly asked to leave the session or to not participate in the discussions. So that's why I'm mentioning that because that has created a, they are not happy within the, the, the key populations are not happy. Thank you so much, Doris, for, for sending, for sharing this. And I had also shared the link about the code of ethics for the CCM members in English and in Spanish. It was also included in the previous uh, newsletter. We have a question in the chat box and uh, we have one hand raised. Gretel, the floor is yours. I'm also from Guatemala. And I would like to ask, we have population affected by TB and malaria who do not have an organization with legal uh, representation. So it has been difficult for them to participate. It is not impossible because we've been able to achieve that. But it is difficult. It is very difficult for them to participate because they don't. But there are no. They do not have. A, there is no legal organization. So, based on your experience in, in other countries, do these individuals can be guarded by a by a by another organization that works with a topic of TB malaria or maybe maybe any other? or can they be chosen just as individuals how can how what can what do you think about that 
decían ustedes de, de tener un perfil un poquito no, because besides uh, what you were saying que tuvieran como ciertas habilidades that they might that they might need to have this uh, technological difficulties or, or so they they sometimes they wonder why why do why should I be part of why why what is the impact or the contribution that I can have to with my with my community as they do not belong to any organization they don't have this support background so they can inform and do and so on so if they are only individuals how can they be part of this or how can they share i don't know if i'm if my question is clear but what, is, what has been your experience if you have faced this type of situation or maybe not and how, if, if that is the case, how is it that you have solved it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Gretel. Yes, of course, not having a, a legal uh, representation is an obstacle for most of the organizations in our countries. Anyone, Anuar or Alfredo? And Anuar is answering, just yes, following uh, Doris' question, it is a... Uh, very difficult to give a conclusion or to give an answer to this question. But I understand the sense and the challenge of this question. There are many, many ways to answer this question. And as you were saying, within these decisions for the representatives of those who could be included in the CCNS, do not have the, the strength of the movement to, to include or to have a, a solid organization. Or it is difficult to find the individuals who can who can have the, the profiles. So sometimes what happens is that when they try to, to play a little bit of with what they have, and this could be valid as long as it works for the country and also as long as it works for the CCM. And can decrease any any weakness. And I have seen that for the cases of malaria. For malaria, it's been complicated to have these solid representatives so that they have all the the whole knowledge, or even to have a, a, an organization dealing with malaria. So that's that's frequently seen. And also. What I have seen is that they made decisions, they made economic decisions that sometimes maybe this cannot be advisable in some countries. So they can define which is the, the best approach. I understand your concern. In my, maybe not in malaria, but also in TB, because there's a solid movement as well as in HIV. And in some decades that uh, facilitate participation, but not that they are not that, uh, uh, that they won't face any challenge. That will be my comment. Thank you so much, Anwar. And I also invite other representatives from the civil society organizations who have faced a similar situation to share their experiences, to share how it is that they have solved it and how it was solved. Now I see the, the hand of Aristobulo, and I was going to ask him to answer, to speak a little bit about this question that Marianne made in the answer and in the chat box, and, and he answered how to sustain a, an organization that works with different uh, key pop populations. So the flow is yours. Well then, basically what I want to say is uh, I want to invite those who want to postulate to the CCM or to be part of that in their countries, regardless the particularities of the regions and the countries that the CCM is a space that especially to the society we have the opportunity to work together. It is true that uh, there are uh, participations based on the key population or specific disease, 
but it is possible that communities uh, can, con can be considered within our own particularities and to have this meeting point so we can uh, move forward of different uh, interests. So the, Hannah was speaking about that. The idea is to strengthen communication, to have a teamwork, to be able to see that this is an opportunity of civil society invited by the by units. And at the end, HIV, TB, and malaria will impact the general community. So that's what I wanted to, to highlight and to invite all of them to that. Thank you so much, Aristobulo. Well, there's another hand raised from Technical Secretariat CCM Colombia. I think that the experience from the lessons learned and from all those processes that have been developed, it's important to mention that Colombia has done this election process only once. So it is overseen that for next year it's been repeated. So this is important that Dr. Ahana has uh, described. But answering the question from Gretel and also I think that that goes on how is it that those organizations of civil society or based community organizations who do not have a legal representation in, in a way that goes against the, the society and speaking about their strengthening aspect, but also that depends on the context of each country. We as Colombia, not necessarily were organizations, but it were, they were representatives of key populations not organizations as such. So these representatives should uh, should comply with the requirements of what has to be reviewed that whenever this election process is taken care of, those terms of references or those candidates who will be looking for should should be should consider also those difficulties. So in Colombia we saw all the requirements and the terms of reference and we saw that those the community based organizations or those organizations civil society were they needed to support that the, the representative comply with the requirements which is a uh, element so that could be a way to do so. And I think that the, the figure that was uh, if if they were going if, if they were going to choose organizations, uh, an alternative could be this option of the umbrella organizations, but these requirements should be complied with. If those requirements uh, are well defined, the comply with the needs for the CCM objectives, then these, these profiles can be put in. And in the case of Colombia, all those key populations representatives should uh, demonstrate and to have developed a communication plan including this need on this bidirectional communication for the basis are not represented. Basically, that's my recommendation that for those terms of reference should be defined or designed, considering those difficulties so they can comply with the requirements and with the needs of the MCP. CCM, sorry. So thank you so much for these uh, recommendations and lessons learned. It's been uh, uh, amazing, the process in Colombia, and many things to think about on how to replicate those for the next uh, processes in the rest of the countries. So let's move on. We are almost about to finish. But before that, I would like to ask you if you can help us on a brief uh, survey about this webinar then it has it should be posted immediately in the zoom box and this is just for us to know a little bit more it will help us on the for the following webinars on how we provide the information that's the presentation the format and the dynamics that we follow how can we improve so we can have not only give, giving information, but also giving the tools to be replicated. So the first question is, how much do you think this information will help to improve the election of representatives of the CCM in your country? Only choose one option. It will help a lot, enough, just a few, nothing. After this session, do you feel um, skillful to participate in the 
in organizing the democratic elections and transparent elections of the CCM. de representantes del MSP, eh, si aumentó o en, o en qué nivel aumentó la capacidad. So if you can tell us exactly why, in which amount that you can participate in these uh, democratic and transparent uh, elections. And do you, do you consider that you, number three is, do you consider that you were able to get to know key tools to create these roadmaps on the democratic elections and mechanisms, communication mechanisms? And the last question, it's a more open question with this. It refers to those topics related with the representatives of the communities and which are. Thank you so much for joining then. And before closing the session, we just open for the last comments. If some of our the speakers, Alfredo, Ano, Artameca, Dr. Anau, final comments. Yes, says Dr. Aida, I just want to thank you for this space and also to invite to invite the rest of the countries for you to promote these processes. And also it is important to have these terms of reference, to, to have them uh, specific on thinking the proper staff. I think that the CCM is in space that is uh, it's an important one on the decision-making process. So in that sense, we need to have uh, people there that are skillful and that they have all the communication skills and the technical skills. Also, I think that within the civil society we have, we have those profiles with high technological monitoring skills uh, to create proposals that really impact in the response in a positive way towards the three diseases. So, Let's not set aside that let's not think that civil society do not have these uh, abilities or skills because we do have we do have these resources and that's the reason why we need to to define those terms of reference they have to be clear and also to to creatively verify that these people have these uh, skills so then those mechanisms are formed with the proper staff members. So thank you so much. And hopefully we can keep on uh, sharing and participating in these type of webinars. Thank you so much, Dr. Enao. Sorry, Anwar. Some people are asking me if we can ask the questions in English. So I will include the questions in English from the survey. Sorry. I just want to thank also the feedback from this survey that you will share us because right now, and maybe some of you answered this uh, survey just to identify the needs, the learning need that might come up from the participation in all these global fund processes. So now we are on this process on systematizing and also identifying what are those areas that we should be focusing our job. So whenever we have a webinar, we will be assessing if we are covering uh, your needs or if we are just uh, contributing to improve your knowledge. So we appreciate your participation because this also gives us guidance for the following activities, mainly by the end of 2024, but also for 2025 and 2026, which are the years that will be guiding you. So thank you so much. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for your interest, mainly for your enthusiasm for this type of sessions. Thank you, Anwar. And I think that we have this last participation from Noé. Thank you so much. I want to thank and congratulate the LAC platform for all these webinars because it is a great uh, learning process for all the, uh, of us that belong to the civil society. 
I would want to also invite our colleague Gretel, as well as the rest of the participants from other countries of Latin America, that there, for those organizations who do not have this legal authority or legal representation, to keep on learning, to keep on training yourselves, to keep on strengthening and to go closer to the programs to, to do the advocacy that will strengthen you. Sometimes also following an umbrella organization implies also to comply with several requirements that maybe at the end, many organizations have so many legal problems that they just ended solving for those who want to update, which is a lot of help. This is an option also, sometimes we need to, to run several risks. As for our case in Honduras, let me tell you that uh, we, as part of the advocacy that we have done as uh, TV organization without legal representation, we were able to promote a special law to control TB. We did not have this legal representation. However, the advocacy that we did was very effective in that sense. So we have had several outcomes. And after two years, we're just waiting for the approval of the law at the National the national Congress. So in that case, I consider that the most important thing that we should include is that you need to be constant, you need to persevere, and to keep on training yourself. Let's focus on those who are, let's pay, let's follow those who are who have the, the knowledge and that are committed not only with HIV, TB, and malaria, but also in other sectors of health. Each topic also strengthens us more and more. And I'm more than grateful for that. Glad to see you all, Dr. Dr. Ana, Miriam, Anwar. It's been a long time to see you, but it is great to meet to meet here. Good, good, good day, and thank you so much. Thank you, Noé. Thank you, Noé. What a great comment to close this session. So, so thank you everyone who joined this webinar for these two hours. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you, Dr. Ena, for your support within this session. This session is recorded in English and in Spanish, and it will be included in the website as well as in the LAC platform. You can see it in the replay. Thank you so much. And I, I wish you a very good beginning of week.